Hello and welcome to Art and Self. I'm Cindy Ingram, your host and the founder of Art Class Curator, the Curated Connections Library, and the Art and Self Connection Circle. This is a podcast where we experience the range and depth of what it means to be human, seen through our connections and conversations about works of art. These art conversations are here to show you that art is here for you as a catalyst, a challenger, a coach, and a comfort. Before we get started, take a moment to fill up your lungs with a deep breath. Connect with your body and your mind and your spirit and get ready to discover what art has to show you. Hello, everybody. This is Cindy Ingram. I'm excited to be back for another episode of the Art and Self podcast. And today I have a really awesome guest, Kate Wurzel, who is an artist and a art education professor. And we had a really amazing discussion. I so enjoyed our conversation. But we realized afterwards that the artwork image that we looked at was actually cropped. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little bit at the bottom we didn't see and on the sides that we didn't see. And they actually made a pretty big impact once we looked at it afterwards. So we will actually be doing a part two episode, which you will hear either next week or the week after to talk about our conclusions that we came to and how the new information of the cropped artwork Im- impacted our interpretations. But I'm comfortable posting this because we had talked a lot about the art making process and just the deliciousness that we saw in this painting. And it's still a really amazing discussion. And what was so fun about this discussion too, is that we flipped it this time, instead of me picking four artworks for the guest, the guest picked four artworks for me. And that was really fun for me to be able to be on the other end of that equation. And I got really excited about the artwork she chose. So I hope you enjoyed that aspect of it. And remember that we were looking at a slightly cropped image, but we will be back to talk about more in a future episode. All right, without further ado, here's my interview with Kate. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be back on the Art and Self podcast. And I have with me today, Kate Wurzel. Hi, Kate. Hello. Before we get started, can you introduce yourself for our listeners? Sure. So my name is Kate Wurzel, and I am an assistant professor of art education at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. Taught in the schools for a number of years before going on to get higher degrees. And just I consider myself a teacher, an artist, a researcher, a person who kind of follows the lived experience. Wonderful. I always see the word Appalachian and I'm like, in my head, I say it five different ways. I was like, yeah, I got to hear (laughs) someone say it correctly. Appalachian. Appalachian. (laughs) See, sometimes I say it like that and I'm like, am I just, is that, I don't know. Sometimes I think that is not right. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for clearing that up for me. It's important. I warned Kate before we started that I'm in kind of a grumpy mood. I don't have very many spoons. And my ADHD is like a, it's like a bad brain day. So right now I'm very easily distracted and I'm very I'm just warning y'all in advance. If you're like, what is wrong with Cindy? It's just life. Life is lifing me today. But I think that this will, this conversation will allow myself to be grounded in art and give me something to focus on for the next hour that will hopefully give me some spoons for the rest of the day. Okay. So what we're going to do today is we're switching it up. And instead of me providing the artwork for Kate, Kate is going to provide the artwork for me. So it feels really weird to be on the other side. I'm like slightly nervous, but I'm more probably more excited than nervous. And yeah. Oh, and also I want to say me and Kate kind of were at grad school around the same time. So I've known her for a long time, but this is the first time to, to talk probably since since then. So I'm really excited about that. And I have one of her paintings hanging in my dining room and it is the perfect thing to hang in my dining room. I get to see it every day and (laughs) the the most, the most used room of the house. And it's delightful. So I'm sure we'll talk about more about your art and that sort of stuff as we go. So I look forward to talking to you about that. All right. So let me give you screen share privileges and then you'll show me the art. Then I'll pick one and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So I knew, I know that this is not focused on like art history. So I made sure to choose contemporary artists that I didn't know much about. Oh, good. 
Yes. So that we, it was sort of this like really nice equal playing field and like unanticipated surprises and good stuff to come out for both of us, to be honest. I haven't dug into these at all. Good. Cause that's what I do too, is I pick artwork. I don't know much about. So, right. and then I don't think much about it when I'm picking right. them. I make sure it's like, has the right vibe. Then I stop because I want to kind of see a fresh too. So I'm glad that you took well, that. And someone, much. someone who like knows artwork and I know, you know, artwork really well. And you all go to museums as a family mm-hmm. and stuff. It's actually kind of hard to do that. I have mm-hmm. to kind of divorce myself from like everything I know and just go by the reaction. So that was kind of fun. Yeah. So the yeah. process of picking was fun. So thank you for allowing that. Okay. Yeah. That's one of my favorite parts too. Okay. So you should have screen share privileges. Okay. And just kind of show me each one and then. Okay. I can't wait to see. This is fun. All right. So we're looking at something by, just, uh, I'm just on the following. Shara Hughes. Hughes. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay. See that. I like to give the titles just for, oh, can you send me these pictures too? So that um, can. I do them. not know the title offhand. I okay, do not that's fine. It down, but I can send that to you later if you'd like. Wonderful. Okay. I know All that right. it's a female contemporary artist. Awesome. It's beautiful. Okay. What's next? The next one is this one by Dana Schutz. Schutz? Oh, I love her. But I've never seen this one. Right. Me neither. I had seen some of her work in a, actually in a book that a colleague provided when mm-hmm. for like a reference for my own work, my own paintings, but mm-hmm. I had not seen this and it's a bit of a shift from what I know of her other work. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. It's usually what I see is usually like one figure or yeah, this is, oh, this is interesting. Okay, cool. So then from here, do you have questions that you, like, how do we oh, proceed it's, forward? Yeah, just I just show all four and then I pick. It's I like to have people pick based on their sort of emotional reaction to it and what like feels right. Okay. And then I'll show the pictures all four on the show notes so that people can see what we looked at. And okay. then so you want you yeah. want the other two? Yeah, we'll just look at all four. Okay, I'll put this one down for now. Sure. This is the third one that I chose. Oh. Hannah von Bart. Very different Neat. vibes from the other two. I can see a connection with your work on this one. Yeah. I really appreciated the gestural quality of this one. Yeah. Oh, and then, would you like the last one? Uh-huh. Jenny Seville. Oh, I love her. Oh, I haven't seen that one either. <gasps> oh, I love your choices. Thanks. Two like bright and cheery and two that are a little like, yes. <laughs> okay. I was so nervous. One of one reason I was nervous is because you had mentioned Motherwell and Cy Twombly and I'm like, oh, how can I spend an hour talking about Motherwell when it just like black splashes? And I was like, this is going to really challenge me. <laughs> but <Okay>. oh, good. <laughs> oh okay. man. So okay. then what would you like me to do? Do I stop yeah, sharing? Well, let me just kind of see them all oh. one more time. Okay, uh, hold on. I think I know which one I want. Okay, wanna... so these two. Okay. And then you want me to pull up the other ones? Yeah, pull up the Shuts one. It's between Seville and Shuts right now. Seville and Shuts. Is, is it Shuts? Shuts? Okay. I can put I'm... Hannah von Bart down. Yeah, I think it's between the these two. Okay, and Shara Hughes I'll put down. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to... Okay, move. it's got to be Jenny Seville. That's the one. Yeah. Really? That's the one. Okay. All right, let me put the Shuts down. It sounds funny to say. I love it. <laughs> and you can, right. if, you, if you want to start your screen share again, just with that image. Okay, um, let's do that. And we're not distracted by the, oh, I've never seen that before. And now I'm like, I've got to see if I can find the title so we know people. Well, people can go to the show notes and I'll have figured out the title by then. But, oh, it's so interesting. It's so different than what I like know of her art. But also the same at the same time. I remember this. Well, I don't want to. Okay. So the the title was something referencing like the masters coming down to earth. Okay. All right. Cool. Oh, it's called Byzantium. I just found it. Okay. Okay. I don't spend too much time on titles, but I like wanted to have it so that the people that are listening know the title. Okay. Okay. So the first thing we usually do is the person choosing shares their initial reactions and why they chose it. And then we describe it for the listeners. And then we just kind of go from there. So I actually would like to hear first, though, like, what made you choose this one? I think these kinds of representation where they're not fully formed yet Mm -hmm. by through gestural work is something I'm trying to 
kind of find in my own practice. And so what was striking to me is how the artist was able to balance the really clear form in like the hand down here and in somewhat in the face, although that's a little less, through these mark makings and then release it in the same image. Like there wasn't consistency of, oh, it has to all be one style. There's a play between line and form here that really caught my attention. Of course, the subject matter is very striking, but what really gets me is like the lack of head and then like, but I still think there's a head there, you know, like that, Uh that was, it was really neat how that play is there. I think that's what drew my attention to it, I guess. Yeah. And like this brown line and sort of these big gestures. Oh, I'm obsessed with this. I can't even handle it. (laughs) It's so funny to see it for the first time. Cause like y'all never get my first reactions ever because I'm always the one picking. So yeah, the reason I picked it was really that same thing, like that, how that contrast between, like if it has a very clear subject, yet it's so expressive and so like, and it's so gestural at the same time. I'm just like, and this man holding this woman, it just feels, fam- it feels familiar at the same time as mm-hmm. something brand new and also familiar. Mm-hmm. So that is really interesting to me too. So let's describe it for those listening that who haven't had a t- chance to really look at it yet. you want to start with a description and then I'll fill in? Sure. <laughs> hard to describe, but it is hard to, a little hard to describe. <laughs> it's presumably a man with his arms folded in front of him with a woman draped over, yet they're both not fully formed in a highly representational way. So there's a lot of color and line lines that make up the form as implied form. There's also what could possibly be gold. I'm not sure. It looks like it could be gold in the background, but I'm not exactly sure if that's going to have that iridescent gold quality or if it's just like a flattish yellow color in the background with a lot of drips. So layers, lines in order to form edges of bodies. I don't know. You want to take it from there? It looks like it's in multimedia. Like it looks like, cause we've got something glued, like maybe a piece of paper glued that has like a little sketch of the woman, like kind of behind it. It looks like maybe, it almost feels like these lines are done with like a, the black lines are not done with paintbrush. It's like, they look drawn on. Right. But yeah, it's like, it's, yeah, it looks, yeah, like charcoal or like a thick oil something or I don't know. The. Yeah, the more I look at it, I'm like, there are many hands. So right. it's not, he has the two hands, but then there's more. But it's just very, like his, his okay. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is so hard. His face is realistic and representational. And his hands are, except for the, they've got like, it looks like paint on them. And then her leg, her shoulder, the side of her face, and her right arm are painted represent like realistically but then the rest of her body is drawn with just like lines and paint and stuff but yeah I mean I think that's as good of a description as we're gonna get you really need to look at it so definitely check out the show notes to get the image to look at Oh, yeah. I love and this, it. Uh, for your listeners to know, this woman's body is very limp, mm-hmm. almost like yeah. he's carrying a woman that is all near lifeless yeah. or is lifeless. I have no idea. It a bit reminds me of some sculptures of like the Virgin Mary holding Jesus in her lap, mm-hmm. kind of draped over so that people can kind of get a sense of what that movement of the body is that he's holding yeah. up. And yeah, and that was actually what my first thought was is in my head, I'm like, oh, that's what this is. I think that's what was so familiar about it. And I was like, wait, no, it's a man holding a woman, but it, that's what it looks like. And it has that like pyramidal triangular like configuration that you see in like, you know, those sort of old paintings. It almost looks a lot like Michelangelo's Pieta and the structure of it. And so I think that was what was familiar about it too. Okay. All right. So this is where I usually ask. So we're going to just kind of do what I usually do. <laughs> so like, I don't know. What is drawing your attention first? What would you like to talk about first on this? I think what's drawing my attention the most is the interplay right here between this hand and the body. Question where this hand comes from because the two hands underneath. And then I see this little sort of finger marks on the piece of paper over here. So, and I guess I'm drawn, like you said, there are many hands sort of in the shadows here. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. 
that are spaced yeah. out most in the supportive role and around the head and the chest area. And that's intriguing to me, how those yeah. are playing out and that sort of tension of all the hands. Yeah. You know what is in that hand? So the it looks to me like that particular hand would be her left hand. And oh. it's so we've got her right hand that's kind of falling out towards the viewer uh-huh. and it's limp. And Uh then it kind of makes me think like when I'm like really relaxed and I'm like laying in bed and my hands are like just wherever, like that is like a, (laughs) I'm doing it all like y'all can see me, but like, there's a, like a drapiness and relaxation of that left hand that, that makes me think that she might actually not, she might actually be alive. If that were the question of, is she alive or not? Like for some reason that hand feels, it feels Like, okay, so (laughs) it feels like confident, like when you're like really confident in your body and Uh you're just like, yeah, I'm just laying here. Like there's no like covering or Mm -hmm. I don't know. It feels, but then her head doesn't feel that, but that's how I feel in her. Well, if this is a hand here, it makes me wonder if this is an echo of a gesture, like a hand that was lifted and then fell. Oh, like I'm here and then I relax it. Right. Yeah. And so there's sort of this trace of her j- hand gesture between these two. I don't know. Oh, that's interesting. Cause then if I look at the other hand, the one that's like right under her head, it, like what it's if one. these hands are all showing like different points in time? Cause that looks like the man's hands that you right. know, they're, they're thicker. They're like, you know, uh, they don't have, they're a little bit more like thicker, thicker is the word. Like maybe they're, those are like different points in time of this story yeah. that's represented. And if touch and trace and gesture is so important, then it would make sense that the aesthetic of this piece has places where youth could think quite possibly that the artist may have put their hands on the painting. Oh. Cause I know I like to work with my hands a lot because it helps me to connect with the actual materials better yeah. But in the medium of the paintbrush, sometimes in the very beginning is hard for me. So yeah. I wonder if this was like conceptually a focus of hands and touch and gesture, if there was some of that as well. I don't know. That's just now I'm, I'm going to look for that. I'm going to look for where I can see it. I can see it in like the paint, the kind of the, that like light pink. Right up here. On Yeah, like on there and then on her body, there's some of that light pink. Yeah. on the chest and on the, like it looks like she could have like smeared it with her hands that's neat I love seeing evidence of the artist's hands in a work of art like anytime I can see like a fingerprint or a or whatever it's like it makes me feel more connected with them and their process and what they were doing and love that well and now I'm seeing so we see like the different hands or if you look above the knees we can see another echo of knees kind of coming up too so it's almost right. like we're seeing the whole movement of this of them yeah Nothing's very permanent, feels kind of in motion for mm-hmm. coming forward. But the artist has given us that movement by sort of revealing her process in some ways. Yeah. Too. I love that. So it feels like he he's walking towards us and he's looking at us too, walking towards us, holding her in motion. So now it doesn't feel like the Pieta anymore. It feels more, more active than that. More dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So tell me, tell me and the viewers about your art. So we know kind of where you're coming from and what, and is it okay if I put some of your, some of yeah. your art on the I mean, show notes too? You can or link I to your page have, if you have one. I have this piece up behind me that sort of shows you the beginning process too. See, I'll duck. I do. I saw it when you, when we were, when you were a little bit bigger. Oh, I can make you bigger and keep the art big. Oh, good. Okay. For me, it's really about connecting with materials and exploring in a super embodied and emergent way, right? So sometimes I use my fingers, sometimes I dance around the canvas Mm -hmm. and on music. Like it's a whole, no, I don't want to say production because that feels performance, but like it's a way to connect with the materials that I'm using and allow them to speak back and speak through. So like, I feel like sometimes I'm co-creator with the paint itself and the canvas, so a lot of what I do is just start in one place and see what comes out, what what emerges. And I really appreciate gestural work, like things where you can see the strokes of the paintbrush and it's not all smoothed out. 
And like you said earlier, you can see evidence of the artist. And I try to do that as well to some degree. But a lot of times my work is layered with emotion, which other artists do, but like, I don't plan what's going to happen when I approach the canvas. So whatever kind of mood I'm in, that's where it lands. And then if I land on something substantial, like I'm not sure that this is going to stay this kind of strange bird-like figure that's coming out. If I, if it takes a directional turn, I want to honor that pivot. Yeah. And one thing I love about following you on Facebook is that I get to, you you show the works in progress. And so I can kind of follow along and like, oh, I remember when that looked like that. And then sometimes like what was there originally, it's gone or it's hidden or it's, you know, it's, and sometimes it's just amplified and it's really fun to see that, yeah. that process unfold Thank you. Uh, for me. So I love that. Okay. So w- one thing you said, and I am a <laughs> I am particularly, I don't want to say averse, but like words that people use that don't make sense to what they're the average person. So you said emergent and embodied. Can you describe what emergent and embodied like means? I mean, you said the um, dancing around and it, so that might have explained it, but I'm Yeah, no, so like the more. embodied part is like really, for me, it's about really connecting with the materials, right? So sometimes it's getting my fingers in it or sometimes it's thinking about like, how is the brush an extension of my hand? Sometimes I'll dance and paint at the same time. I've used a big giant mop before. So it's using, I've used my feet before. I've had my students use their feet. So it's not just about the body, but like looking at the physical connection that I have Mm -hmm. with the materials at hand, I guess. And spending a lot of time sort of being present in the space of creation, like making sure that I'll give myself the time and space to come create. And that is hard when you're a mom of three and a professor and so on and so forth. And I think we just have a hard time honoring that need sometimes. And when I can get out here and I can sort of embrace the process through my body movement, that helps me to connect to the space. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. That's okay. good. I just wanted to hear it. Yeah. Hear it, hear it more. Love that. Yeah. Embody is a word like I think people say a lot and I say it a lot too. And then I was talking to somebody recently and they're like, I don't think the average person knows what embody means. I was like, yeah, you're probably right. That is kind of a new kind of buzzword in like. Yeah, I I think uh, it's, I think that embodied is both about the body, but also just being present in the body for the experience you're going to have. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm having a physical contact. It's about being here to understand what the sensations I'm Mm -hmm. having. Yeah. And yeah, when I use it in in, not related to art, it's about, yeah, connecting with like how I'm feeling in my body and getting in out of my head and my physical in my physicality. And I love that what it's so funny because, you know, I think we talked about this on messenger like a few months ago, but I have recently started making art again. And after a very long time, and one of the things I had built up in my head is that you had to have an idea of of what it was going to look like in the end. No, completely knowing that wasn't true. I've been studying art for my whole life. I know that's not true for a lot of art. It is true for some artists, but not all artists. But in my head, I was like, well, I got to have an idea and I got to be able to implement that idea as I see it in my head. And so I felt like I couldn't do that because that's not how I work in any way of life. And I think it's been fun for me as I've been exploring my own art making, watching yours unfold and seeing how you don't know, you know, you don't know where it's going to go. And it's, I've been really inspired by that. So thank you for sharing that because it is, I'm about to start painting. I have not painted in a long time. I've just been working small in my journal, <laughs> but I'm like, I have a painting in me. I realized it a couple of weeks ago and I'm just like getting ready. So it's fun too. I'm glad we get to talk about that. because Yeah. And I think very real. I think that's the emergent component that you asked about Mm. that we haven't really talked about. So that was like a really nice way to bring it back around, I guess. Emergence being really recognizing what is showing up and not being so attached to previous ideas that you can't follow what is showing up. Mm -hmm. And I think the hardest part, at least for me in artwork, and then if you take this philosophy and sort of give it a blanket to life, is like the non-attachment to what was. And understanding that, like, for my paintings, often I'll use what was in a sort of unpredictable way to then create something else. 
And so it's not that I'm completely scrapping it. Like, it's not like we, we cut off those that we passed with completely. Right. But that we sort of learn from it and grow from it and we keep following it. And that's the same thing I think with painting, but what you were talking about with like predetermining an image that you want to paint. I was stuck in that too for a long time. And then I sort of forced myself to start doing this as part of my PhD work, but I did start forcing myself to do it. And I saw the ripple effect of it in the rest of my life. And it's been fascinating. I've learned so much by just opening up myself to the process of painting. It then kind of gets, allows me to not have so much attachment to strong emotions in everyday life in the same sort of manner, I guess. Yeah, that has been completely true for me too, especially with the writing of my book. That's that mm-hmm. writing process is teaching me all of those same lessons and it's just rippling out. And an example of this, just kind of a real life example, it was just like a couple days ago. My daughter's about to be ninth grade. She's I mean high school. I can't believe it. But they're picking their their like high school courses. And my friends and I were having this kind of debate <laughs> where one kid had prom like said she was gonna be doing theater. And she was going to proud for the musical and she was going to do this and that. And then she decided not to do it. And then the mom was like, well, do I force her to do it? Because she said she was going to do it. And I'm like, well, I think one big lesson here is like, it's okay to change your mind. And we sort of get this lesson in our early life that you make this decision about your life. You make that decision and then the rest of your life is following that that path, that decision that you made at that one point. But every day you're a different person. Every month, well, and- you know, every year you're a different person. And it's okay to like change your mind and move on and use what you Yeah, learned. and I think we're also taught in parallel with that sort of false understanding about having to stick with something. We're also taught that if we do shift, there's a bit of shame involved. Yeah. And that's hard because you feel then feel like, oh, I'm disappointing this person. Well, you know, it's also your choice. And yeah, yeah, so I releasing that is kind of difficult when you make a shift. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of in line with what we were talking about, like if I go back to the painting we were looking at, for me as an artist and as someone who thinks about this in sort of a in line with teaching, I think like where did this person start the painting? Ooh. And Where did it go? And is this the same direction it started in? You know, so I have curiosities about that. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think she started with? I don't know. I mean, perhaps there's a sketch underneath or, you know, uh, some of these lines that we're looking at in the painting, they look like they're preempt, like preparatory sketches where they could have been. But in order for that to happen, then the paint couldn't go on top. So in some ways, I think maybe she started with the paint and then added these gestural lines on top. I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah. And you know what? I completely unrelated, but I just found her face. I found her eyes and her nose and her lips and I did not see it. Do you see it? <laughs> it's there. There's a little right pink here. Blob. See, that's here. her. No, it's go up and to the left. There's a, that's her lips. You're on her lips. And there's a chin line that goes over that white paper and then there's an eye and an eyebrow kind of under her lips. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> you might see it eventually, but I'm like, oh, there yeah, she has a whole I'll stare at it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of this time, you'll find, you'll see. Like, oh, oh, but I, yeah, but I see is. where you're, but like this line draws the form of the other side of the, the chin. Eight. Yeah. I think it's interesting that the organs are present, but not super realistic looking. They're only present through sort of the lines and the implied line, like the implication that they're there. Yeah. I, you know, I hadn't thought about them being organs, but I did think about those black lines being like the bones and the skeleton. But now, of course, they're organs because there is like little drawn shapes. There's there. And then there's that like rusty red that could be blood and the blue you know, could be like, you always see the blue veins in, or is it arteries that are blue veins, maybe. Oh, it's cool. Well, and to think about too, what, how, where she started is like, I look at that spot in the top left where the gold drips and then there's like paint underneath it. You see there's like pink and blue right. and behind all of that gold. And right. So, and that, that pinkish paint kind of matches this what might have been an early head yeah an early attempt at the head underneath that was just never fully covered up Mm -hmm. initially I don't know 
It's really interesting. Yeah, it's like I, I feel like she just sort of mapped out in general where things would go with the paint very expressively and then slowly kind of started adding in those details, but then kept all the stuff behind it. Right, which gets which back to love. like what we were saying. Like if you change your mind, it's okay. That old stuff yeah. is still going to be there, right? Yeah, it's still a part Absolutely. of who you are and it still led to where you ended up. And then almost like led to where you're going because then we've got this forward motion too so it's like we can kind of see the past present and future all represented in the the Mm -hmm. art here then well now thinking about the future i'm like what if she is becoming is she okay i have two two theories of what's happening with her she is either becoming or unbecoming (laughs) like is she becoming more real as he moves forward or is she like becoming less real as he moves forward it's almost like it looks like one will take over the other, the realism taking over the the lines or not. Like, is this like a walking towards birth or like a birthing? Ooh. Or is it a walking towards death because she's yeah. limp? <gasps> yeah. And then like as, ooh, I like walking towards death. <laughs> because she, sorry. I'm like, yes. You're like, I'll choose it. that one. <laughs> <laughs> because like, she, she's like, and if, so I'm imagining like if this was animated, you know, and mm-hmm. then going forward and like she becomes more and more. And then the, like she's becoming like, she's, it's almost like, you know, he's the same colors that she is. He's like, she's morphing into him. And then eventually we'll just kind of become the earth and become what's around her, which is death. But then also, yeah, I guess you can think of birth being the same way. But I think if it was birth, you do come from nothing and you're formed, but I feel like it would be more womb-like and, the, and just like her, the limpness of her and the full-bodiedness of her, adultness of her is showing that. I also really appreciate down here, there is a line that runs sort of off the composition, mm-hmm. it's an implied heel, right? Yeah. From, the, from her leg, how it droops down, it could be a heel, but then it also could also be or here could be a calf line I guess but it also could mm-hmm. be the arm line of the man so oh. in my own work I really like to play with confusing the viewer but not in like a malicious way but where you start to think that all things in the painting are connected and you're not sure if one line is an animal or one line is land you just don't quite know yeah. and I get that same sense right here in the yeah. corner at the bottom right corner yeah. Ooh, I love it. Yeah. I love that, that she has that blank canvas under at the very bottom. It doesn't go all the way down. It doesn't go all the way across, but it, I don't know. It, it shows that it's a painting. I mean, it's very clear it's painting, but there's something about like having this stuff overlap, having the paint drip under or through that is really, I don't know, pleasing to me. I don't know what other way to say it, but I don't know if there's any meaning behind it. I just like it. <laughs> I like that. And I like the drippiness. Well, it definitely draws your attention Mm -hmm. and it kind of plays with the viewer. Like you're saying, you're like, is the bottom of the canvas finished, not finished, but like, it feels good. It still works. And so it kind of, I don't know. I feel like it takes my attention downward because Mm -hmm. she intentionally left parts of that open. Yeah. I'm trying to, I keep trying to imagine like what it would look like if that wasn't there. I feel Like it's, yeah, it's like necessary for the balance and the movement and the keeping your eye in it too, like a compositional thing. So, okay. I know you can't see her face fully yet with the eyebrow and the eye, but I see it. Now I can start to make out her expression. Uh And to me, it now is starting to look like Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa. Okay. Like she has this sort of like her eyes are closed and it almost it looks like a kind of to me it looks like kind of like a blissful expression on her face. Okay. I have a whole story I happening. I can see the eye. <laughs> I think I can see yeah. the eye and mm-hmm. eyebrow now, right here. Yep. yep. It's so fascinating. Those just look like innocent like gesture marks. Yeah. Paint drips and then hmm. Okay, so now I have this whole, okay, so she's walking towards death. This is my story I'm creating. Okay. She's walking, they're walking towards death. She's she's in the, like, crossing over into the whatever's next or into nothing or to something, whatever that is. And then he's holding her. And this whole time, he there's this ancient Egyptian quality to him. Like, it's like the angular, like the this kind of... I don't know how angular this is the right word, but the, his face has a very like familiar structure. And then the gold, his hair is like gold. So it kind of looks like it could be one of those 
headdress things that the pharaohs wear, all the gold behind it. And that and the ancient Egypt was all about the afterlife. Mm-hmm. You know, that was their big thing. So I'm like, oh, is he like Osiris or <laughs> You know, whatever right. it is. I'm, like, oh, I'm having such a There's fun some time. Sort of intermediary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a queen world. Hair on. Sort of- that would be ancient Greek, but I don't know the ancient. I have to ask my daughter. She's obsessed with ancient mythology. I have to ask her <laughs> later who, who's the person who carries you into the afterlife in ancient Egypt. It might be us on the river sticks. There's probably somebody. Anyway. Or is that st- now I'm getting all my mythologies confused. So excuse me. My art history degree was a very long time ago. Mine too. It's all good. <laughs> oh, love it. Oh, it's so fun. Okay. What next? What are you noticing? Well, I think it like it takes a lot of courage for an artist to leave a big bold brown line yeah. in this way. But I what I love, and I know that this is more just like an aesthetic thing, but I really appreciate a rudimentary, very sort of station based mark Mm -hmm. more than anything else. And like, especially when the paintbrush is dry and it runs out of paint and you can see that on the brushstroke on the canvas and the artist leaves it. And to me, this brown, big, giant, thick brown line that sort of comes in and out of intensity on the right has that quality of like my brush ran out but I kept going or I Mm -hmm. dipped and then you know if there's a flow to it where you can almost sense that like the artist was just feeling the movement of that line and really appreciated whatever emerged from that you know yeah because I know when I try to do those types of lines I start to to get in my head about it and then I start to overthink it and then I'm like oh this is not gonna work and how do I get like and that's what it is how do I get out of my head and into my arm into the movement of the arm and then just let whatever happens in my arm happen but um, this oh, is I just the, connected with your painting style really yeah th- I was really saying <laughs> this is the dancing right yeah it is because I have one painting that I did it's in my living yeah. room it's like and there's this one like green line that's kind of swirly and I knew I wanted it there and I was like okay I got one chance at this <laughs> you know and I started to side by and then I all I did was just like I had to like completely shut it off and I just like like let it come through my arm and I'm like oh Ooh, this is making me want to paint. This painting is making me want to paint. This is exactly what I need to be looking at today (laughs) as I prepare for this painting I'm going to make. But I like the way you phrase that. You said you let the movement come through your arm. And I think sometimes it's about allowing ourselves to Mm -hmm. go there more than anything else. Oh, there's a life lesson there too. Yeah. like Right. But to allow it, you have to be embodied in the way that you were talking about it. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I love those lines too. And like comparing them with the ones right right immediately to the left of them, that one is really kind of flowing, but then those are more like the other brown lines are more kind of choppy. So you can like even you can imagine the artist there like doing that kind of more flowing one and then doing that more choppy mm-hmm. one. Oh, it's neat. I love it. I think a lot of times when I do something like that and it feels really good, but then I'm like, oh, other people won't like it as much as I do because they won't feel it. So I start to second guess it because I start to worry about the perception of others instead of the movement that I just allowed. And when I worry about the perception of others, then I have to go, do I need to fix it when I didn't really think that there was a problem before? And so sometimes I'll stand back and I'll do like this and I'll say like, okay, if I were to cover it up, do I miss it? Yeah. Like, you know, do I miss it? No. Yes. I'm going to miss it if it's gone. So I'll leave it. That's the kind of like the, so okay. still thought rapidly happening in the head, but it's like a battle of don't give in to worrying about what other people think. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's like, you're making art to be seen at the same time as you're making art for yourself and you're right. making art as, a, as an extension of you and your body and your emotions and all the things, but you also have that viewer in the back of your mind going like, do you want them to feel what you felt? Is that what you want for them when they, what do you want from your viewers when they look at your art? I want them to connect with it. Honestly, in whatever way they connect with it, but I like to pour enough intensity into it of myself that I hope that comes through in the connection. Like a lot of people will look at my work and be like, oh, I see this, or I see this, or I see this. And often I don't direct 
the looking nor the interpretation, because it's not always what I envisioned as it was unfolding. But I do think it's important for people to have their own connections with the work. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there is, there's a magic to that happens that the artist often is unaware of. And I've noticed that just when I'm working my art journal, that I'll work on something, I'll live life for a couple days, and then something will happen that is about what I made. And then I come back with a new view and I'm like, oh, I add that in. And then it's like, and then in like a week later, someone will say something to me. And I'm like, oh, that is exactly what I just, that was the meaning of what I just did. But I don't even know. I didn't even know at the time. That's what the meaning of what I just did, but oh, that's the meaning. <laughs> and so it was just this sort of like circular process that feel, it just feels so mad. It feels magical to it and you really allow it to be. And so yeah, I don't like I wonder as like as Jenny Savelle was making this, like all the meanings she had and at all the varying stages, like her the meaning she had at the beginning was probably something completely different. And then now the meaning, you know, I, I don't know when this painting was made, but you know, a year or so after it's made, like how what does it mean to her now? What has happened in her life to where she looks back on it, be like, oh, I, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. And one more thing, I'm gonna stop monologuing here, but it reminds me of the Franz Mark. He painted Fate of the Animals. Do you know the story about that mm-hmm. painting? Mm-hmm. So Franz Mark made Fate of the Animals. And like two, right before World War One. Okay. Might be World War II. I'm pretty sure it was World War One. Then he went to war and fought mm-hmm. in the war. He died in the war. But he wrote a letter back to his wife or somewhere. And he's like, that painting was a representation of this war. And I think the quote was, I hardly believe I painted it. Like he was felt like he was seeing into the future when he painted that, Mm. that painting. And so that's what I just love about paintings is they have so much life in them long after that dance that you did, (laughs) you know, the dance that you did like then is now going to continue to give people meanings. Like even the painting, I'm sorry, I'm continuing to monologue. Apparently even the painting I have of yours on my wall, like that means something to me, but then like, that, that painting is then going to mean something to my children. And then like law after I'm gone, they're going to have that painting and it's not, it's going to be me that they're seeing. Right. And also you and, you know, and also their child. And I'm like, ah, okay. So I will stop. It continues. That was a lot. It can, well, it just <laughs> it continues to evolve and have a life of its own. Like, yeah. and that's why I say like, it feels like a co-creation. Like sometimes it doesn't even feel like physically, like I'm doing it. And then I step away and I'm like, Oh, I did that. But it's like, I don't feel complete ownership over it because I don't know why I don't know why. And then whoever buys the painting, it then takes on a continued life. Right. Yeah. But what I also love that what you're saying about your own journals is that you sort of see where this intuitive feeling is coming out in your work and then you see the application of it or you see something that resonates with that. And it's like almost as if sometimes we can tap into things before they're actualized or like we can sense them a little bit before they're sort of coming to fruition. And I don't know, I think that's fascinating. I don't quite understand it and why it happens, but I understand what you're saying. I don't know why it happens. Yeah. There's like, there's no like science to it that I can understand the only thing I can really truly understand is that I this the to explain it is that the subconscious you know we're we have more senses there are more things to be perceived in the world than we have sensory organs to perceive them right so but our subconscious potentially could be perceiving things that the rest of like the, our conscious senses aren't perceiving. And so there's, you know, that's my scientific explanation of that sort of thing. And then also, we prime yeah. our brain to like look for things mm-hmm. in the process. So uh, I also think that like art makes the imperceptible more perceptible. Yeah. You know, like it takes those sensations that maybe they don't have a tangible reason or I don't know takes the things that perhaps we don't have words for and then and the sensations and the affect or it makes it more visible yeah more real yeah that is very true and then people connect with that some don't and that's subjective and that's where the viewer comes into play like you and I both really connect with this painting yeah and someone else is going to look at that and be like gross (laughs) (laughs) gross <laughs> <laughs> like I can see how someone would find this to be really gross 
<laughs> well, and a lot of Jenny Seville's are a lot of people could look at and be like, oh, you know, but even like Motherwell and the more like the black line contemporary uh-huh. thing, I could stand in that front of that painting and be like, oh, my God, I love this so much. I feel the energy of the line. And my dad will this has happened. This is why I'm referencing it. My dad <laughs> will come up and be like, I don't get it cool. Like it doesn't <laughs> yeah. speak to him in the same way, you know? Yeah. Oh, and it's funny. Cause you know, I thought, what if she shows her mother? Well, I was like, well, I don't have to choose it when she's going to choose four <laughs> or what if she brings four mother wheels? And But then I was like, I could, yeah, I could also stand in front of a mother well for a long time and feel the energy of it. But I was like, how do I even, how do I even talk about it? Because uh-huh. there's so much that just happens in your body when you look at some art that there is not words for it. And but that, right. like what you're saying, that's what art is making the imperceptible perceptible. And it transcends language. It tra- you know, there it goes straight to feeling. It goes straight to energy. That's what I love about it. So much. Like this artwork is pure energy. Like it just is, it is just like almost like has an aura of energy around. I want to see it in person. I have to find it. It's so there's so, so much to it. I have to say for your listeners who maybe haven't seen it yet, I do love where the contact between the male hand and the female form on both the right arm and the right leg, the artist did some shading in there that kind of shows the pressure points of the contact, Mm -hmm. applies it, I guess. And I think that it's really beautiful because it just, you know, everything that's the only more representational, realistic portions of the painting. Yeah. It's like, you can see how fleshy she is. You can feel like her, the warmth of her skin and the suppleness of it. Okay. I didn't write down what time we started. It was around this time. Was it? Has it been about an hour? Yeah. I think we have about 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Good. Maybe okay, a so... little less. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <Me either>. <laughs> <laughs> but I've lost track of time. I mean, too. I was like, I could talk forever. Okay. I just want to keep track. Okay. What feels... For 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What feels like left unsaid here? What is making you curious? What is drawing your eye? I think I really love... I don't know if it's a piece of paper the piece on the mm-hmm. left, it's the large rectangular off-white paperish thing that that has black marks on it to imply her chin, this mm-hmm. over here. Yeah. I really like how this just kind of blends into the body. So I guess I would like to see more of that sort of mixed media. I don't know if she does it in her other work. I, from what I know of her other work, I cannot remember any of them being mixed media. She paints portraits of mostly fat people. The one I saw in person was like, well, it was just like a lady's head with like a, looked like a, I felt like a bullet or something in her neck. Like they're very much women, fleshy women, very, but they have like more gestural backgrounds, but then the women are more Oh, yes. I did see like the um, more, yes, the bodies. Yes. Yeah. And I wasn't the, sure if I could do full nudes, so I <laughs> stayed away from those. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> yeah, I don't censor any of that. I, now that <laughs> okay, I work cool. with, now that like Great. anybody can listen, I'm like, yeah, we'll just do whatever we want here. Good job. Um, yeah, but her work is really stunning in person. I have seen, I've seen several. Oh, you know what? I can't, I actually, I might be getting something confused. Oh, it's okay. We, I'm doing this art madness thing on my Facebook page right now where people uh-huh. are voting. And I could, I put her against Tracy and Mean, and I think I could be getting two of them mixed up, but I'm pretty sure I got it. They're both very like about bodies and expression and different things. Yeah. I do love that part too. And his hands to me feel very, like, I know like she is limp and she, you know, that has a lot of these sort of aggressively drawn lines, very like all this energy, but like, it doesn't feel like he's hurt her it doesn't feel like he like murdered her and he's carrying her dead body to go bury it you know it feels like those hands feel strong and supportive and more loving for some reason I don't know where I'm even getting that but it doesn't feel like he's this like evil guy that just killed her to me I agree it feels benevolent yeah supportive but he still exudes strength but not in a violent way yeah and it may be that like that he has that like little slight little tiny slight smile and then he's like he's looking out at me and but his look doesn't feel creepy it feels connected like it feels like like he I do I now I'm looking at him again I'm like he does feel you know like he feels otherworldly feels like someone with compassion and the way that she's so floppy 
feel if she feels if she is alive i think she feels safe with him which if you were just to take all of the if you were to take just and just look just at the lines and all that this that like i don't like that would that feels like it could be like more dangerous but yeah there's something away about the way she does it that doesn't feel that way to me Okay, you were talking about the paper, and I totally see there was my ADHD. I'm like, I don't go five different directions away. <laughs> like, wait, I didn't even talk about the paper because, like, I distracted by something else. Oh, you asked if she does other work. That's mixed media. She might. I just haven't seen it. I'm looking. So I and I see that same kind of color of the paper reflected in other parts of the painting, like his what I assume would be his shoulder right under that brown line. Like that's kind of the same color, but and it looks like it has like of a more of a sharp line than some of the other things do a sharp edge than some of the other things do so it's like i like how you and you see that color kind of in the leg down below too so it's like there's like a little repetition of it but i don't see any other things glued on but i like it because it you we see the artist process and we see like the things she was thinking about i was like i'm just gonna glue this right on i think as an artist it's hard to know when to stop Sometimes and yeah. this, this is especially true of young children when you're teaching art to them. Mm, yeah. And I think it's hard to know when to stop because w- sometimes we struggle with, have I yet attained the picture in my head? And for kids, if they can't get to that, you know, they get turned off and they start feeling as if they failed. And so it's a tricky space to be in as an educator, but for myself, for my own practice, it's hard to know when to stop because I'm just so excited. I want to keep going, but sometimes like I need to listen to the lines that are already made. And I feel like this artist does a really good job of listening in process to what the material, not only what the material is, but what she's doing with the material. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there really is something about the process of painting or even it happens in my art journal too, but there's something about like, it is looking at the picture and looking for where it doesn't where one part doesn't feel right <laughs> but it's like it like well we had something missing is you know is there is it unbalanced not like we go I don't know I don't know about you but I don't go through like the elements and principles of art and be like does it have balance does it have rhythm it's just like I feel it's a, that it's it, here yeah it's a felt thing and so when I look at it and like i yeah, and I feel like she did this masterfully because all of these little tiny things like they all feel so chaotic but feel so intentional at the same time and it looks like Exactly. It just looks like nothing's missing. Nothing. It, I feel like if one thing was added, like that would mess it up. I don't know. Yeah. When, yeah. How do you stop when your paintings look like this? But I have had art journals that I were a completely other thing. And then I layered something over the top. And it's like, there's one that I'm like, I know there are three layers of completely different things in there. Cause I didn't know when to stop. And then I messed it up. And so then I just kept going. And then I, but it, I learned a lot from that process mm-hmm. too. The, oh, that one was overthinking and not getting into my into that like energetic tapping into the energy of it thing for a while I got into a habit of when I would get angry in the process and frustrated I would throw black paint on the canvas oh and my my daughter now whenever I mean I don't do it as much anymore because my as I've continued to work my process has changed but my daughter's always like when I say I've changed the painting, you want to come see it? Because I love to have her see it and be surprised. And she's always like, did you paint black all over it again, mom? So <laughs> they know sometimes. And she said to a friend the other day, she was like, sometimes mom paints black over when she's mad at me. And I was like, I do not. <laughs> Their perception of when I paint black is very different from mine. It's really funny. <laughs> well, that shows you like how much people are just primed to make things about them you know <laughs> well true like, <laughs> but like we also just natural like, thing i think also just you know having a space to get your emotions out it's helped mm-hmm. i just have stopped destroying my own artwork in the process <laughs> as much <laughs> Now I'm going to go look at my painting. I'm like, do I have black? To ju- do I have black? I'm like, I might. I you know. feel good though. I'll tell you, it feels good. It's just afterwards you go, oh man. I have one extra canvas to the side for the throwing of black. That's um, right. <laughs> that could be a fun, ex- fun experiment. Oh, I'm so happy you introduced this painting to me. I just am. I absolutely love it. Good. Well, I think, I hope it changed your day. It did. I feel amazing. 
I really <laughs> did not feel good this morning. <laughs> I had already started to turn it around by the time we started, but you know, my therapy, I had therapy this morning. She was like, what would help you get some spoons back? And I was like, well, talking about art and looking at art does give me spoons. I was like, but I don't have enough spoons to get to the museum. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I have a podcast. And then I feel like I have to be good. And so then that, that takes spoons. So I got, to, I was like, but good conversations give me spoons. So I was like, this could give me a lot of spoons. And it did. So good. thank you. Thank you for all the spoons. And if y'all don't know what I'm talking about, there's spoon theory on the internet that you can Google. I'll put it in the show notes just because you don't know what I'm talking about. Do you know what I'm talking about? I okay. I figured you would know spoon theory. But okay. Oh, so yeah, I have tons of spoons. I'm going to go like clean my house or something next. I have to go pick up my children in a moment. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Not as fun. Okay. So this was wonderful. I feel like we got a good, I feel like we could keep talking, but it, we've been about an hour. How can people engage with your work online if they want to follow your process? Do you post that anywhere? And can I link to it? I really just do it on my Facebook page. I'm very bad about keeping my website up to date. I do have a website that they can go to, which, you know what? Honestly, I'm going to use this as a point of inspiration to update my page. Ah, So it won't be there right now, but they can check maybe in a week or so if they're interested and I'll try to update by then. But it's my full name, Kate Wurzel, and then arteducation.squarespace.com. Got it. Perfect. So I will post that. And this episode, you'll have done that by then because I think we're not going to, I think you're two weeks away from being post it. Okay. So, okay. And then you um, can just also link the Facebook page too, if you want. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kate. It was wonderful to talk about art with you today. You too. I had a great time. Thanks for the invitation. You're welcome. All right. That was my interview with Kate Wurzel. It was amazing. I loved it. We'll be back again for a part two, like I talked about earlier, because we have some more inches of the artwork to talk about. But if you're interested and and if you were inspired to create as much as I was in that time with Kate and you want to explore your own creativity, your own art making, please join me in the Creativity Cocoon. We meet several times a week for art making in community. It is artandself.com slash cocoon. We have these sorts of conversations about art making and you can be with me as I explore this desire I have for painting big. It's coming soon. I ordered an easel and everything. So I'm going to be painting soon in the coming weeks. So all right. Thank you so much for listening. I will see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to Art and Self. And if you loved what you heard, please consider leaving me a rating or a review on iTunes. And share this episode with one friend who you know needs to hear what we talked about today. You will find links to the artworks that we discuss over at the show notes at artandself.com. And you can also join my email list to get notified of all of the new upcoming episodes. The videos of these episodes are also available over on YouTube at Art and Self. And you can also follow me on social media on Instagram at Art and Self and on Facebook at Art and Self Cindy. Thank you so much for listening and have a wonderful week. I'll see you next time.